just thought it would be worthwhile um, dealing with um, a couple of um, issues raised in uh, this week's Weekly Worker. We've got the article Nature's Gift to Humanity uh, by Comrade uh, Emil Jacobs. Uh, to me, this reads like, um, how should we put it, um, publicity. I'm not suggesting it for a moment, but it reads like publicity sponsored by the nuclear um, um, industry. You know, to save nature, to save humanity, uh, we've got to invest big uh, in nuclear. And uh, nuclear almost doesn't seem to be able to do anything wrong. Um, either way, um, I'm accused of um, not uh, misrepresentation when it came, comes to the facts, uh, but putting things in a biased way. This is a reference to my last article on um, you know, the green question on uh, global climate and all the rest of it um, on techno fixes. Now, my main um, target in that article actually wasn't the nuclear uh, industry, but I did note uh, renewed enthusiasm for it, but it was uh, the main target uh, was um, uh, basically changing the climate, geo um, engineering. And uh, I was basically saying, look, this is dangerous. Um, you know, you might be able to tweak it, uh, but all the um, evidence tends to indicate that things are a lot more complex um, than models can actually predict um, what the outcome would be. In other words, there's a danger, uh, according to various commentators, and I'm talking about scientific commentators, uh, not politicians such as myself, um, that, you know, you, you put up, for example, an eye shade over the world, you know, cross, cost of five trillion dollars. Um, you know, who knows what impact uh, that would have in terms of the climate system. No one really knows. Um, certainly, if you, you, sh you know, you shoot up sulfur dioxide uh, into the upper atmosphere, it could have the effect of just just turning down the thermostat a, a degree or I should put it a fraction of a degree or so, maybe. On the other hand, uh, if we actually look at a volcano, a volcano such as Krakatoa, um, it was responsible for something like a three degree drop um, in global uh, temperatures when it comes to the northern um, hemisphere and of course that um, impacts on uh, crops, uh, it impacts on, um, um, I should put it, biodiversity, um, you know, and not just for one year but for several years. So uh, the impact is unpredictable, it's not an exact science. And then I looked at nuclear and simply said, well, at the moment it's clear uh, that nuclear um, is a lot more expensive than um, renewables, in particular um, wind and solar, and of course it's dangerous. And when it comes to the Holy Grail, um, i.e. nuclear fusion, um, it's 20 years away, and it's always been 20 years ago, uh, 20 years away, uh, ever since it was first mentioned. Um, uh, as a potential replacement uh, for nuclear fission, uh, which of course lets off an awful lot of um, uh, dangerous um, um, byproducts um, that have to be buried, have to be stored, um, have to be guarded. Um, either way, this is what the comrade uh, was aiming at. Um, really? Um, is nuclear that much more um, expensive. Well, when we look at the figures for LCOE, that's levelized costs, it's true, he says, and it is true, uh, that nuclear comes in something like four times um, as expensive. Now, none of these figures are exact because, it, you know, different parts of the world, more advanced, smaller, more compact, you'll get different figures. Um, so none of, none of this is... Um, um, you know, exact. It's a ballpark uh, a figure. But then he says, but if we include firming costs, uh, which is the cost of putting in the infrastructure, putting in the power lines, 
then things even out much more. And that's most certainly true. Nonetheless, having admitted uh, that that is the case, we're still dealing with a situation uh, of where I don't think there's any argument uh, that nuclear is still very expensive. Uh, if we take uh, wind farms, if we take solar farms, for example, because they tend to be dispersed, um, you have to put in new uh, infrastructure. That means in a country like Britain, we know it, it's going to be happening now. Uh, an awful lot more power lines, an awful lot more uh, pylons uh, are going to have to be put in place. And that has to be included in any reasonable uh, assessment uh, of, of cost. OK, so having uh, conceded that, um, what I think it's worthwhile doing, and again, this is just, um, uh, how should I put it, just what came up in when I Googled nuclear power costs versus solar, etc. This is the first Google site I came up with, but it seems to be a respectable uh, site, and that's the um, Australian site of uh, uh, its science agency, plus um, it, it, its um, energy market operators, uh, and they claim and I'm not in a position to um, um, either confirm it or deny it, but it seems um, reasonable to take it on face value, maybe I'm naive, um, that uh, this is technically neutral. Uh, because what's going on in Australia um, is a debate about whether uh, to go over uh, to wind and solar. Like, so I, as I understand it in South Australia, um, they've um, abandoned black coal. There's plenty of black coal in Australia. Australia supplies massive amounts of black coal uh, uh, to China. Um, and there's a national debate about basically uh, how to go green because the old national government, national liberal government, has been replaced by nice progressive. Um, Labour Party government under the former firebrand left wing leader uh, of the Labour Party. And so there's this debate happening. And here are the figures that they're coming up with um, in terms of the um, science agency and the existing operators. And what they say is, look, if you take wind and solar, if you have a 60 percent coverage, that's a big ask. That's a big ask. But if you go for 60 percent, uh, then um, wind and solar comes in between $73, and this is Australian dollars, and $95. Uh, if you go for 90% coverage, which is a big ask, okay, Australia is a very sunny uh, country. I don't know about it, its winds, but they get an awful lot of sunshine. That's my understanding in terms of this continental sized uh, uh, country. If you go for 90% coverage, then the costs rise to around about $128. And this is for million kilowatt hours and uh, all the rest of it. On the other hand, you then get in between um, going over to solar and wind and nuclear. And I'll come to nuclear uh, in a second. You get the uh, grading of uh, gas, black coal um, and um, um, you know, various other uh, categories about um, using uh, gas for peak hour uh, consumption and all the rest of it. Anyway, uh, my main point is that with large uh, nuclear plants, uh, instead of getting a, a $73 bottom rank, and I do emphasize the bottom rank when it comes to solar, uh, you get um, a price tag of between $141 uh, to a high of $233, which is sick. And this, by the way, is including um, costs of um, infrastructure uh, and all the rest of it. But when it comes to, and this is worthwhile, uh, a worthwhile uh, note, when it comes to small nuclear reactors, which the present Labour government of Keir Starmer is busily trying to sell us in Britain, then at least in Australia, the cost there per, you know, kilowatt, you know, um, thousand kilowatt hours and all the rest of it is something like uh, $230 and up to $382 uh, 
uh, uh, dollars. So uh, to me, there is no argument uh, that, uh, yeah, once you include uh, infrastructure, of course, uh, the cost of um, um, high, um, the cost of wind and solar uh, goes up, but it doesn't go up uh, to anywhere near large uh, nuclear uh, uh, power stations, let alone these mini uh, uh, power stations. We're also told by Comrade Emil, and I must admit I double took on uh, his figure, uh, that uh, nuclear power stations can last 80 years. Now, I'm not in a position uh, to say that he's wrong, except I would say uh, that, well, I'm not quite 80, uh, but in my childhood, uh, we were always being taught about the wonders uh, of nuclear power. I was of that uh, generation. Um, because in Britain, um, we had the first civilian uh, power station opened up to, in my memory, I think it was 54, 1954. But the point about civilian use uh, nuclear power stations, this was sold to us, uh, not on the basis of the truth that this was intimately linked in with Britain's drive uh, to compete with uh, the Soviet Union and the United States when it came to being a nuclear power. That was the real purpose of Calder Hall. Uh, but we were told uh, that uh, electricity from civilian uh, nuclear power would be so cheap uh, that it wouldn't be worthwhile uh, metering. It wouldn't be worthwhile charging. Um, it would be uh, an abundant and more or less uh, everlasting uh, source uh, of free um, uh, energy. Well, I've already illustrated the point. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Nuclear isn't um, isn't cheap. Um, it is amongst the most expensive um, um, options uh, that we face if we're going to transition off uh, carbon, um, 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 uh, you know, fossil uh, fuel. Um, so yes, compared with um, coal, uh, gas. Uh, undoubtedly uh, nuclear can be cheaper, but it isn't a cheap uh, option. And then we come to the question of decommissioning. Now, I don't know, I mean, Emil is writing uh, from, the, from the Netherlands. I don't know uh, the situation in the Netherlands. I'm not claiming uh, to be an expert, um, so I'm just doing a quick bit of research, but I have got, have got a memory and I did recall accurately, hey, this doesn't sound right to me when he said that decommissioning costs are included in the price uh, that um, uh, the grid uh, is charged when it comes to nuclear. Um, I'm sure that is true. Um, the problem is, as the uh, Public Accounts Committee in Britain uh, revealed, um, what's been happening here um, is that the decommissioning costs had gone uh, through a doubling process. Um, so um, the cost, for example, of um, decommissioning uh, Britain's seven heritage uh, nuclear power stations, which has been done previously uh, under the ownership of the EDF, that's the French energy uh, company, has gone up uh, to 23.5 uh, billion. And uh, the Public Accounts Committee was saying uh, that it looks like uh, those costs will keep climbing. And the problem is that it's not EDF that pays for that. It's something called uh, the National Decommissioning uh, Authority because the EDF company offloads it at a certain point um, onto this public uh, body. So no, uh, decommissioning isn't included uh, in it. And all we need to do, and I'm not saying this is an annual cost, uh, but think about Fukushima uh, in Japan. Uh, the decommissioning costs of that are projected uh, to be in the region of $235 billion. Uh, so a very, very hefty uh, price tag. But also, as the comrade himself says, uh, that uh, given the uh, global um, climate crisis that there is, and I introduced my last article precisely making that point, 
that if you look at the IPCC, um, it's saying that this year, 2024, and the next uh, uh, years until 2028, uh, on a global level, uh, we're expecting temperatures to exceed on average above uh, 1.5 degrees. Now that was put as a limit uh, back in Paris uh, that they would keep the, the rise in temperatures below that threshold. Um, so it's an arbitrary uh, threshold, I, I readily admit, but it looks to me, not only will we break that threshold this year, uh, but we'll break it the year after, the year after, the year after, the year after. So we're not dealing uh, when it comes to the climate crisis any longer some long-term threat uh, that lies way, way down the line for our children and our children's children. This is something that we're dealing with now and you need remedies now, not in five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 or 50 years uh, time. You need to be doing something now. There's a crisis and we all know uh, when it comes to the climate uh, it resembles, it's a proverb I know, but it resembles something like an oil tanker. It takes a long time to turn around. And as a throwaway figure, uh, I used uh, a thousand years. And I think that's true uh, when it comes to the melting of the permafrost, when it comes to the melting of glaciers, uh, when it comes to the shrinking uh, of the ice caps. This isn't something you click um, a switch and it all goes back uh, to how it how it was. Uh, there's energy um, contained within uh, the climate system that will keep pushing uh, the global um, um, global temperatures upwards. Um, so when you look at nuclear, uh, as the comrade himself says, uh, the problem is uh, that um, they take a long time to build. And all we need to do, I'm not sure, is it Hinkley Point C, uh, our latest one uh, in Britain? First uh, on the uh, drawing board 2007, uh, building work started uh, in 2014. It was due uh, to go uh, online and start putting power uh, into the uh, grid uh, 2024, that's this year. It's going to miss that uh, target and it isn't going to reach that uh, stage uh, next year, the year after or the year after that uh, either. And the tendency in the nuclear industry is things take an awful long time because you um, uh, come up to um, there's technical problems, um, which is beyond me. Uh, either way, that is. Uh, the history and I don't know whether I mentioned this I think I already have but didn't give the answer um, uh, as to how long these things last um, and I don't think I gave the answer to that again this is the International Atomic en Energy um, uh, Agency now again maybe it's biased uh, maybe it's full of false information I'm um, someone tell if someone tells me it's a load of rubbish fair enough uh, but the figure that they use for the um, uh, life expectancy of uh, a nuclear power station is between 20 and 40 years, uh, not uh, Comrade Emil's 80. And the precise problem is that if you extend the life uh, of these um, uh, things, uh, then uh, their safety uh, becomes more and more uh, problematic. And it's true, I suspect, uh, that if we take uh, deaths either directly, but certainly indirectly uh, from fossil fuels, uh, they massively, massively outnumber uh, deaths, uh, either directly or indirectly uh, from the nuclear industry. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Again, talking about my age, uh, I live in London. I've lived in London most of my life. And uh, as a child, I distinctly remember, I live in North London, I live up high, uh, but I distinctly remember uh, London smogs and um, just seeing London and all you could see is St Paul's sticking out above. And this wasn't just an ordinary fog. Uh, this was a killer uh, gas and you'd come home and, oh, 100 people, usually old people, people with asthma, died um, today. 
next day 200 have died um and that so that excludes you know mining accidents and all the rest of it but all i would say is when comrade emil says well you know nuclear is safe yeah i go yeah um but you have to as he says you have to store some of this stuff for hundreds of years and all i uh, would do is say well look at ukraine look at kursk and what we have is the threat surely um um you know either deliberately you know from one side you know bringing uh, the temple down uh, upon them um there's talk about the kursk nuclear plant or the zavosita uh, a nuclear plant which is in russian hands um a nuclear accident and who knows um we are in the um uh, area after all of um, chernobyl um which did uh blow and uh again in terms of direct deaths uh not that many uh but uh, indirectly who knows um we weren't um consuming after all uh, welsh uh, milk um so the idea that we can predict the future um that things are going to be so safe um uh, i think is a mistake and lastly i i reiterate the point uh, that the nuclear industry is very closely associated in terms of expertise the pool of um, um, science and um, uh, technology uh, with the um, weapons industry so for example uh, when i heard the shah of iran um, on tv talking about iran becoming uh, a civilian nuclear power because at some point uh, uh, oil and gas in Iran would run out. Uh, I didn't think to myself, what foresight uh, this man has got? Um, you know, what vision has he got? Because um, uh, there's no chance, in my view at least, of oil or gas running out anytime soon. I know we had this peak oil um, nonsense, uh, but the reality was, you know, what went on in my mind is that Shah has a hankering uh, for nuclear weapons. And so precisely in Australia, we're not just talking about the transition um, from black coal uh, when it comes to power generation. We're also talking about AUKUS. Uh, we're talking about uh, um, Australia uh, with nuclear submarines and potentially somewhere down the line, uh, nuclear weapons. And I'll finish with that.